pretty much good to go. I just waited until a few people come into the room. Um, yeah, perfect. So we're live now. Um, first of all, thanks very much to everybody for joining us, in particular to Lord Reed for taking the time out of his schedule to, to speak to us today. We really, really appreciate it. I'm sure he's incredibly busy at the moment. Um, so before we get into the interview portion of the event, I'm just going to say a few brief words about the society and why Lord Reed is receiving the Praise Lead Award today. So the Law Society was founded in 1933, and for 87 years, the Society has strived to provide its members with opportunities to socialize, to engage in discourse, and to experience new phenomena. The Praise Lead Award is an integral part of that endeavor. It is given to those who have left an indelible impact on in the chosen field and who have advanced discourse and societal thought in the process. The award was founded by Mary Robinson, a former auditor of the Law Society, and of course, the first female president of Ireland. Rarely bestowed, the recipients of this honour include Sir Bob Geldof, Sarah Rafferty, Max Schrems, Lord Newberger, and Samantha Power. Recipients this year include Niall Horne, Stephen Fry, Nicholas Sturgeon, Gina Miller, and Brian Stevenson, to name but a few. This year in particular, the Law Society wishes to place an emphasis on empowering students not only in their careers, but in their everyday lives. And it is for this reason that Lord Reed has been nominated. Lord Reed was appointed President of the UK Supreme Court in January 2020, following a lengthy and distinguished career as a judge in the United Kingdom. Lord Reed was appointed to the UK Supreme Court in 2012 and also serves as a non-permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal of Hong Kong and previously served as an ad hoc judge at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, he, has also, he has been chosen as a recipient of the Praise Elite Award in recognition of his contribution to the British legal profession and the common law world. He is a great source of inspiration to law students around the globe and it is a great honour for our society to host him. And so without further ado, I would like to present Lord Reed with his Praise Elite Award um, which I can't even hold physically because I believe it is in transit, but um, you have hereby been presented with the award, I suppose, and with a particular thanks to our sponsors, Evershed Sutherland as well. So I don't know if you have any words of acceptance or anything like that before we get into it. Well, yes, certainly, Jonathan. Well, fellow lawyers, um, whether you're students, academics, or practitioners, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honoured to have been nominated as a recipient of the Praise Zealot Award for 2020. Um, the list of previous recipients, which I was given, could hardly be more distinguished. It includes a number of people who've been important in my own life, um, such as Lord Newberger and Lady Hale, and also a number of judges from other jurisdictions who have influenced my own thinking and for whom I have the greatest admiration, uh, such as Michael Kirby uh, from Australia and Beverly McLaughlin. Uh, from Canada. I'm honoured that you feel that I belong in that company. My only regret is that I've been unable to travel to Dublin to accept the award from you in person, as I would love to have done. Um, I have visited your city a number of times, uh, but I'd very much like to know it better than I do. I'm not going to make a long speech, but I would like to share a few thoughts with you, um, relevant principally to those of you who are studying law or have recently begun legal practice. I've been proud to be a lawyer ever since I qualified. It's not a job like any other, and it's certainly not just a means of earning a living. It confers privileges, and it also imposes obligations. It's a privilege to be in a position to advise other people about their rights and obligations and expect them to act on that advice. Uh, to represent them in court when their rights and liberties are at stake, and above all, to sit in judgment over them. And those privileges are accompanied by responsibilities to uphold the values of the profession and to conduct ourselves in a way that exemplifies those values and merits the respect which most people are willing to accord us. It's not just what the profession does, um, or indeed what it stands for, is what it stands up for that I think is important. In my country and in your country, as in other democratic societies, lawyers and judges stand up for justice, for the rule of law, for the vulnerable. In normal circumstances, I do quite a lot of traveling to courts and legal conferences overseas, and I often visit countries where the judiciary is not independent or where the rule of law is felt to be under threat 
or where people are still recovering from periods when the vulnerable were at the mercy of the powerful. I recently had to write to the Chief Justice of Afghanistan, um, whom I met at a legal conference uh, last year, to express my condolences on the murder of two of his female colleagues on the Supreme Court by the Taliban. Uh, the women having been targeted, it seems, because of their gender. I travel from time to time to speak to judges in the Balkans, particularly in Bosnia, a country which still bears the obvious scars of a conflict of the 1990s. The people bear the scars of that conflict too, and also the scars of the period of communist rule which preceded it. Those are less visible than the damage to, in the streets of Sarajevo, but more profound. We in our societies can't be complacent. We're perceived abroad, both the British and the Irish, as beacons of tolerance and of the rule of law, but that's not always reflected in some of our attitudes. For example, in the United Kingdom, we've recently seen a resurgence of anti-Semitism, which one might have hoped had been shamed forever by the Holocaust. Even at the level of mainstream politics, we've seen in recent years in several democracies how issues can be inflamed by divisive rhetoric. This is an area where lawyers and judges can set an example. Lawyers conduct a debate that is courteous and rational, lis listening to the other person's point of view and giving a reasoned response. In a world that is changing rapidly and turbulently, we need more than ever people with a lawyer's habit of mind, weighing evidence carefully and considering arguments rationally. Perhaps above all, we need lawyers what the world feels like to those who are vulnerable. For those of you who are studying law or have recently started practice, it will be your vocation to give people reason to believe that justice is possible. Democracies and their laws seem to me to represent the best possibility of justice in an imperfect world. Lawyers and, and politicians in their different ways are the people who have the duty to make that justice happen every day. The duty to do everything possible to make the world more just so that all our citizens regardless of race, religion, or gender, can live in dignity and peace. The Prizes Elliot Award, with its emphasis on inspiring enthusiasm for the legal and political spheres and making contributions to those spheres, reflects your society's commitment to that objective. The people you honor with your awards, like me, have largely made their contribution by the time that they receive the award. You students and young lawyers are our hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, and actually the, the ending part to your speech there actually kind of leads into my first question, um, which I guess you mentioned there sort of students and trying to promote a sense of justice in, in the future. So. Where, where, I guess, for, for, from the perspective of your own future, where do you hope to take the Supreme Court during your tenure? And uh, what do you hope to achieve, I suppose, on the whole with the Supreme Court? Um, well, the, the first priority, I think, is the same as for all presidents of the court, which is to maintain its position as one of the world's leading common law courts. Um, that can't be taken for granted. We have to work hard every day to make that happen. I've got three more specific uh, aims uh, during my presidency. One is to build a stronger relationship with Parliament. I, I took over the position of president after a period of some turbulence in our constitution domestically, as you may have heard. <laughs> may have. Uh, and um, it resulted, I think, in a degree of mistrust and misunderstanding 
between um, the courts and parliament, and I'm keen to address that and build a, a stronger relationship, and I'm working on that. Secondly, um, I want to also to build a stronger relationship with the lower courts in our jurisdictions. Uh, a Supreme Court can look and feel rather remote uh, and elitist, if you like, from the perspective of judges and lower courts. So I'm trying to work hard to do that. For example, if you follow our judgments, you're going to start seeing quite a lot more judgments where we have judges sitting with us from lower courts, whom we're inviting to sit with us to get experience of the court, to see what it, um, how it operates, and to carry that back to the courts that they've come from. And thirdly, um, I'm keen to support diversity and inclusion in the judiciary and in the legal profession more widely. Um, we do have an issue about the ability of people from different groups in society to become judges. And um, I don't think it's, it's not peculiar to the judiciary. I mean, one would see the same thing in the upper levels of most walks of life, I think, in the UK. But um, we need to address it. And um, we're doing our best to do that at two levels. We're at the end of the pipeline, if you like, of, of, of lawyers. Um, we, can, we can and we are uh, doing what we can to, to, to encourage more diverse applications at our end of the pipeline. But over the longer term, we're going to achieve much more in terms of influencing who enters the profession in the first place. And uh, so we're working with um, groups that try to encourage and facilitate entry into the legal profession by people from what are called non-traditional backgrounds. And you, you listed there sort of a lot of aims and objectives, which are all sort of rooted in the general spirit of justice, I suppose. Yes. I was wondering when you start, well, obviously when you started studying law in Edinburgh and later at Oxford, what sort of drew you to studying law? Was it just that overarching sense of justice or was it simply a case of liking English and history in school and then going for something that kind of matched up? With that? Okay. Well, um... I did like English and history at school. Actually, English and maths were um, particular enthusiasms. Um, and I wasn't at all sure when I was a schoolboy what, what to do after, after school. And um, I actually just walked into university lectures and sat in on a law lecture and an English lecture and a maths lecture. And I, th I thought, the I found the law lecture much the most interesting. And I had a feeling that doing other subjects would be a bit like just carrying on doing what I'd been doing at school. Uh, whereas law was something new and uh, felt grown up and interesting. And because I was interested, when I started getting interested in it, um, I lived, I was brought up in Edinburgh and like Dublin, it's a city with law courts, and so I would, when I had the chance, I would go in in an afternoon and watch what was happening. And I must say, I was quite attracted by the glamour of uh, barristers and the idea of addressing courts on, on problems. Um, so um, so, that, so I, I went into studying law, I'm afraid, without any um, great ideals about justice in mind, but simply because I thought it might be an interesting thing to study. Yeah. Sure. And then I suppose the justice came. Obviously. Well, yes, you get <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you mentioned there sort of uh, when you were speaking about your aims for the court, you mentioned sort of things like diversity and stuff like that, mm. which has obviously come to the fore a lot more in recent times. Yes. Running since you became a judge in 1998, I believe, to now, how has your approach to to determine the, the result of a case changed in any time? Do you feel like you have to take into, take into account more sociological issues now than you would have back then? Or are they just different sociological issues? Or is it very much just the facts that are in front of you? Well, um, I think my approach has changed. Of course, the cases have changed yeah. because 
you know, as a, as a, as a judge sitting in the High Court, I was doing a lot of criminal trials, uh, civil trials as well. You're mainly fact finding. And I didn't have all that often to write heavy legal judgments, uh, which is what I do all the time now, uh, of course. Um, but the, the main difference, I, I think, is that I've become um, more patient as I've got older. <laughs> I hope so anyway. And less, um, less certain that I've got it right and more inclined to um, more inclined to listen to others and to be cautious before I express a, a view. I was given a, a bit of a ticking off when I joined the Supreme Court. There was a wonderful judge on it who's a dear friend um, called Robert Walker, Lord, Lord Walker of Gessingforp. And we were doing a case together um, about tax actually. And when it came to the end of the case, we had our discussion. Um, I, as a junior judge, went first with my views. Yeah. And Robert, when, he, when it came to his turn, he said, um, I, wish, I wish I was as certain of anything as some people seem to be about everything. <laughs> and that was a real lesson for me. So, um, I mean, he didn't mean it maliciously, but um, he had a sense of humor. And uh, I took that to heart. And that certainly affected the way I approach cases now. Absolutely. Um, I guess another thing that kind of links into the, diver the diversity objectives that you mentioned for the court. Mm -hmm. I believe at the moment only 4% of senior judges appointed to the High Court or above are from ethnic minority backgrounds. And I was just wondering, what do you think needs to be changed? Obviously, what needs to be changed is that more people from ethnic minority backgrounds need to be appointed. But do you think that the change has to come at a deeper level than that for that to occur? Or are there kind of uh, systemic barriers within the courts that are preventing more ethnic minorities from being appointed as judges? Um, I don't think there are systemic barriers within the courts. Um, the the legal profession is very market orientated and talented people will, um, I think, I, I, um, I think nowadays, talented people will do well, um, whatever they look like. There are certainly, um, nowadays in London, there are plenty of successful barristers who, who come from minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, some of them becoming judges and more will over time. Sure. Um, but um, there's certainly a shortage of, um, of people from some ethnic backgrounds. I think, I think the most intractable problem is, is really to do with structural inequalities in society uh, generally. Um, social inequality, I think, is a particular problem. I mean, if you, if you, I mean, you might say, well, there are very few young black people who become lawyers and become judges. There are also very few white working class people who become lawyers and become judges. I think um, social inequality and consequent inequalities in access to education. Um, you know, whether you're talking about Oxford or Cambridge or the London leading, the leading London universities, or I dare say, and say might be true at Trinity, um, people tend to come who are, who are doing law and um, they tend not to come from working class backgrounds on the whole. And um, there's not very much that people like me as judges can do about that beyond encouraging um, schemes that there are uh, for um, talented people from whatever background. And we do that. Uh, we have, um, for example, in, in, in Britain, there's an organization called Bridging the Bar, which tries to assist um, young people um, who 
don't have the sort of access that somebody from a professional background would have. Um, and uh, of course, the Black Barristers Association. And we, we assist the, them, these organizations, by providing work experience at the court, um, by um, having the, allowing them to shadow our judicial assistants and speak to justices. And we hope it encourages them. You know, and we do have um, black ju judicial assistants, for example, in the court. And at least half our judicial assistants are women. Um, so we hope that they can see and you know, they talk to these people and they discover that it is actually possible to be, for example, from a Pakistani working class background in East London and end up in a leading barrister's chambers. So, so um, you know, the idea is to try to inspire people and give them more confidence. Yeah, and I guess a kind of maybe a broader question leading on from that is you, you kind of touched on there, um, obviously the impact that sociological barriers have yes. the formation of the court. And I was just wondering if if there is a decision in front of you where, say, the facts. Let, let, I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Would you, as a, as a judge, be more inclined to go with a decision that sort of seems at a face value to mirror the spirit of justice? Or do you find that obviously in the position that you're in, you're kind of constrained by the law in any sense that in some case you might not be able to protect the weaker party on the basis of some kind of technicality? Yeah. Um, well, um, it's, I think it's a slightly complicated answer. We, we are guided by the law. Yeah. And that's what we have to apply. Um, if the law drives us to what seems to be an unjust result, then we will start asking ourselves whether there's something wrong with the law. And as a final court of appeal, it is possible for us to adjust the law within, within limits. Um, but the bottom line is um, you have to decide what you, what you believe the law is, and that's what you apply. And as, a, as a saying, hard cases make bad law. Yeah. And um, I've seen myself how um, that, that is true. Um, I mean, the difficulty is you only, you only deal with one case at a time. And sometimes there can be a, a rule which is of a general nature and particular facts um, throw up a hard case in which to apply it. Um, and then as I say, the, the question is, do you make some sort of adjustment to the rule, which would enable you to arrive at a fairer result in the particular case? Or do you have to stick with the law as it is? Yeah. And um, that could be a difficult judgment. Sure. Um, and you spoke about there, just towards the end there, you were talking about uh, obviously the potential for changing the law and stuff like mm. that. The UK government kind of leads into this. The UK government has recently set up a panel to examine judicial review and oh, yes. so it should be reformed. So for yourself, does the mere does the fact that such a review um is occurring, does that create a tension between the executive and the Supreme Court? And if there is such a tension, how do you how do you manage it, I guess? I know you mentioned earlier that one of your key aims is to kind of create a, a better harmony between the yes. and the executive. Yes. Well, um, I, I don't think it, I don't think it should uh, create any particular tension um, because I mean, at the end of the day, um, the government and one would, one would think the government, parliament and the courts are all alike committed to the rule of law. Um, and um, parliament, I mean, the laws that Parliament makes bind the government, and the courts are there to see that the law is enforced when we're asked to enforce it. And, um, and obviously, the government doesn't set out to break the law, but sometimes mistakes can be made. Um, government's acting under a lot of pressure, and the law isn't always clear. And sometimes we take a different view uh, from the advice that it, ministers have presumably received um, as to what the law is. Um, but that's 
that's part of a of a democratic constitution working properly. Yeah. Um, so we have to, we as judges have to explain, I think constantly, that what we are doing at the end of the day is supporting parliamentary sovereignty by applying the law enacted by parliament, because otherwise what's the point of parliament enacting it if we're not going to, if it's not going to be applied. Um, and, um, but at the same time, um, we have to be careful to respect the separation of powers and, you know, judicial review can raise some quite difficult questions as to where you draw the line between um, applying the law and interfering in a, in a policy issue. Yes. So we have, to, we have to try to draw that line as carefully as we can. Um, and, um, and obviously, if there, are, if there are grounds for concern that the procedures we're following or the remedies that are available are causing unnecessary problems for government, then that, those are matters that can be addressed. Um, for example, if the procedures are too slow or if rules on standing are too generous, um, that these are the sorts of things that, um, that could quite properly be adjusted. So, so at the end of the day, um, in relation to the review of administrative law, for example, uh, we have put in quite a constructive response, uh, I, I hope. It's a perfectly proper matter for the government and parliament to look at. And uh, I hope that they'll um, take account of what we've said, and particularly the emphasis that we've placed on understanding that it's a perfectly proper function of the courts, and it's not one that should be seen as setting us in opposition to government or parliament. Um, quite the contrary, where one would hope we're all pulling together to try to maintain a democratic society. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess another thing that's kind of had, well, I, I assume has had a massive impact on the British legal system is obviously Brexit. Mm. Uh, and I, I guess what kind of if you were to try and summarize, I guess, what, what do you think that impact would be? Um, I'm sure that that could go on for hours. Like, yeah, yes. Yeah. What's the legal impact of, of Brexit, I suppose? Yeah, well, I think the, the answer at the moment is it's very difficult to say because we're at such an early stage. Um, we have got the first appeal in front of us now where we are being asked to apply the Brexit legislation. And in fact, we're being asked to depart from a Luxembourg ruling um, on the interpretation of EU law um, in relation to um, uh, some issue about social security law. And we'll be hearing that appeal in the middle of May. Um, so um, I think at the end of the day, the, the impact and how, how it will affect us will depend on the extent to which the UK in future decides to mirror what's happening in the EU or decides to strike out on a, an, a different approach. Obviously, if we're, if the, if, if, and it, it'll change, it'll vary from one area of life to another, I suppose. But if we're, if the aim of UK policy is to mirror the EU approach in a particular area, they're not, then there's not going to be a very profound effect on what we do, except that we'll be having to decide matters ourselves rather than make references to Luxembourg. Um, on the other hand, if uh, the UK government decides to pursue an independent line on issues, then um, clearly we'll be, we'll, you know, we'll be at the top of the food chain in, uh, in deciding how, how that gets applied. And is that something that you you would welcome, or does it create issues for you, or is it just? I'm 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 quite relaxed about it. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the court as a court doesn't have a position on Brexit, or, or uh, we we just apply the law that you know, the law of the land. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I guess what, obviously Brexit was kind of portrayed or portrayed quite negatively, and another thing that I guess has received a bit of a negative portrayal recently is at the British Supreme Court, I suppose, particularly following the Miller judgments. So I was just wondering how, I guess, do you 
how do you hope to alleviate those kind of negative portrayals and yes well um that particular period was an exceptional one and it was a very uh febrile media atmosphere at the time i'm hope i hope that um that we'll be able to put that behind us um, sooner rather than later. The, the coverage of us at the moment, I mean, for example, we, we've issued, we issued a couple of high profile judgments in the last few weeks, one about Uber yeah. and one about uh, Shamima Begum. And the press coverage of those was uh, mixed um, but quite balanced. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're subject to scrutiny by the media quite properly. And in each case, the initial reporting and, certain, and the reporting on television was simply factual. The, the newspapers eventually have more opinion pieces. And some of them thought that what we were doing in each case was, was good. And others thought that it was bad. <laughs> and that's, that, that's life. Um, but if we're being if we're being criticised from both sides, in a way, that's reassuring. Yeah, for sure. And so that's that's not really something that would keep you awake at night. No, it doesn't keep me awake. At night. <laughs> <laughs> Probably rightfully so. Um, so I guess just before we, I, I'm not sure if people have any questions in the in the Zoom audience. If they do, we'd welcome them to put them into the Q and A box. But just as a kind of a general question for a law student such as myself or for anybody who's watching, uh, what kind of, what would be one overarching piece of advice that you would have for, for as well? Um, I, I would say, if I was giving you one piece of advice, it would be um, that the legal world is a very small world and a reputation for integrity is vitally important for any lawyer. And so you, and the, th the thing is, you, ha you have to maintain it constantly. And if you once let your standards slip, it's very difficult to get that reputation back again. So um, let me give you an, an example, actually. Just after I became a judge, I was asked to sit on an appeal um, which I wouldn't normally have been asked to sit on, of course, because I was so junior, but I was there to make up the numbers. And I took, a, I took a different view of the case from the rest of the court and wrote a dissenting judgment. And I was then visited by other members of the court to tell me that the presiding judge was offended by this, felt I was undermining his authority, and that it would be best if I were to withdraw my judgment and it might damage my career if I didn't. God. Well, I didn't. Now, I forgot all about that. I mean, it was that's decades ago. I forgot about it until I, when I became president of the Supreme Court, I received letters from former colleagues congratulating me. And quite a few of them mentioned that, that incident. Now, I didn't know that that had become widely known within the bar, for example. Okay. But it obviously was. And um, it just shows, I think it's just an example of how just one principled action can give you a reputation as a person of integrity, which lasts decades. And equally, one unprincipled action could have the opposite effect. Yeah, sure. Um, we have another question here from Elizabeth Ring who asks, right across the common law world, as we deal with various regulations designed to prevent the spread of COVID-19, people are now very concerned about the rule of law in such emergencies. Do you think the COVID-19 will have long-term impacts on how people engage and understand the rule of law? The rule of law? Um, I, I'm, inclined to, I'm inclined to say no. Um, the, um, the difficulty with a, an emergency, I mean, a public health emergency like that, is that government has to act very quickly. And um, 
in order to enable it to do that, our parliament gave government very broad powers to make delegated legislation. And I can I entirely understand the concerns. I mean, I mean, for example, some offenses being created with quite serious punishments without the parliamentary scrutiny that there would be if it were an act of parliament. Um, and it, it has, one has to be careful that these, that sort of behavior is, um, is confined to emergencies and that's the responsibility of, of parliament. But um, I was looking at this uh, with a view to giving a, a lecture as it happens about, um, about this sort of issue. And when you look at how countries have responded to previous health pandemics, going right back to the plague, the great plague in England in 1665, for example, there's exactly the same pattern of um, very broad powers being given in, in country after country, and as I say, going back um, hundreds of years, uh, to enable the government to respond effectively without having to go through the normal checks and balances of the constitution. Now, as I say, it's only in um, a public health emergency or wartime that that kind of, um, that kind of response would, would be acceptable. But, um, but I can understand why parliament gave the government the, the broad powers that it did in the situation that we were in, in March, in February, March of last year. And do you think that once those kind of powers have been granted, that even when the coronavirus ends, it'll be hard to remove um, their applicability, I guess? Well, um, a lot of the powers in, in the UK are time limited and they need to be renewed periodically. Okay. So, um, so it's up to parliament whether they get renewed or not. Uh, and for others, um, I mean, it's true uh, that, so for example, some wartime powers in the UK were still being exercised um, long after the war was over. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a matter for the public and our politicians to, to bring that to an end. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for example, there was a, in Britain, there was a case where somebody was asked to produce his identity papers in, I think, something like 1951. And the need for these papers had been brought in in wartime and legislation had never been repealed. And uh, so this man was prosecuted for refusing to produce his identity papers because it was such an un-British thing to be asked to do. And he was convicted but I think within a few days of that, the legislation had been repealed because there was such an outcry and the, and the matter was taken up in Parliament. Yeah. yeah. And we just have one more question here um, from Annie Wall, who asks, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Ah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so as you've mentioned that in the pre-COVID world, you used to travel quite a bit as part of your work. Do you think that the necessary move to using electronic communications as a substitute for work-related travel would be a permanent change after the pandemic ends and that the international courts will embrace conducting conferences, et cetera, remotely. So it was actually something that we spoke about before we went. Yes, yes. Well, yes, you and I were speaking about this earlier and I was saying I, I'm sure that there will be um, less international travel by judges, certainly, uh, than there used to be, and indeed lawyers. Um, I, was, I gave you the example of a meeting we had the other day with the Japanese Supreme Court, which we held in this format and which otherwise would never have happened. Um, and it, it, hadn't, it just had never occurred to us beforehand. You could do it like this. And it obviously makes sense. And another example I gave you was how on my court, we hear appeals from the Commonwealth and people were coming to London from places like Jamaica in order to argue the cases. And in future, um, we have certainly, we'll certainly be offering to do it um, through remote hearings. Although, as I told you, when we mentioned this to some of the lawyers, they were very reluctant uh, to give up expenses paid uh, trips to London. <laughs> <Not blaming. laughs> 
We have another one here from Eve Cassidy who asks another thank you for speaking to us today. We're getting all the thank yous now. Um, and she also asked, Do you think that it's time for the UK to introduce a written constitution? Um, this, I don't think, it certainly is the time. The, I mean, the effect of a written constitution, I mean, you, I mean, you, obviously, you and Ireland know more about written constitutions than, than I do. But the effect of a written constitution is to accord final power um, uh, in, your, uh, in your legal system. Um, whereas in the UK at the moment, Parliament has a final word. And I can't see Parliament being in any hurry at the moment to transfer its power um, to, to uh, the Supreme Court. If anything, the concern has been that we were acting more like a constitutional court than uh, many uh, in government and politics felt comfortable with. Yeah. Okay. And we've just another one here from Matthew Wainwright who asks, in your experience as a visitor judge, do you think that judges should continue to sit on benches as visitor justices when the independence of legal systems are undermined by their executive bodies? Mm. Well, this is very much a live issue for us at the moment in relation to Hong Kong. And um, I'm going to be, the way, the way that we're dealing with it in the UK is that um, I've been monitoring what's happening quite closely and discussing the implications with our foreign secretary and our Lord Chancellor, who's our Minister of Justice. And in fact, I'll be discussing these matters with them, I, I hope next week, um, to see what we feel the implications are of uh, the most recent developments. But it's something we take very, we take it very seriously and we look at it very carefully. Of course, uh, we just have one more here, I think, because we're just we're conscious that we're running out of time. Um, Michael Gilna asks, you mentioned tension arising overriding a dissenting judgment at the level of the Supreme Court are personal or professional relationships between judges regularly affected by their disagreements on a case? No, they're not. Um, we, um, we get on very well and it's um, taken for granted that we um, are going to disagree sometimes. It's really terribly important for the good functioning of the court, you know, to producing good judgments but everybody feels confident about expressing their point of view uh, without any concern that it's going to upset people. And so I, I certainly treat it as part of my job to ensure that the discussion is always good humoured and courteous and patient. And um, in fact, we, we, we get on pretty well. Great. I mean, just I'm sorry, just sort of one final question here before we go. Um, so again, thank you to Lord Reid for a fascinating talk. Uh, the decisions of the UK courts are obviously of important persuasive authority to Irish legal practitioners. Um, would you be able to speak as to the UK courts attitude towards decisions of the Irish superior courts mm -hmm. and to the extent to which they consider them of assistance? Oh, well, we do look at, we do look at Irish um, case law when it's cited to us. And it is undoubtedly of assistance um, on a whole range of areas. Um, I think the last one I, I looked at was to do with um, the, um, the, 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 the seat uh, of companies for the purposes of EU jurisdiction law under the Brussels regulation. And um, your court had had quite, your, um, your courts had had to deal with that quite a lot because of Ireland becoming a bit of a letterbox um, you know, a place where companies will have a base, um, but it may not be where the business is actually being carried on. Yeah. Um, and so it's an issue that the Irish courts had looked at quite a lot. And, and so when we came to deal with it, we um, were taken to quite a lot of uh, Irish case law. Your constitutional court's case law uh, is, is certainly important as well for us. And um, Ireland's actually one of the most important jurisdictions for us in terms of judicial cooperation. So we have a few jurisdictions that we try to have meetings with um, at least once every two years, if not more often. And they're um, Germany, France, um, Ireland. Those are the three main jurisdictions. Brilliant. We also meet others, but less frequently. 
So, for example, at the moment, um, Frank Clark, the, the um, president of your um, constitutional court, is someone, well, well, we had an exchange actually with Frank and his colleagues um, in, the, in December. So that's three months ago. And before that, my last meeting with him had been the previous February. So that was twice a year. Yep. Uh, so we, we do keep pretty closely in touch with the Irish judiciary. Great. And a very, this is definitely the last question here now. Um, so we have, uh, are you concerned about Britain's position as a centre of international litigation now that they have exited the EU, especially since it is possible that the EU will veto Britain's application to join the Lugano Convention? Mm. Mm. Um, yes, well, the EU is currently blocking our um, our uh, adherence to the um, Lugano Convention. Um, I think the, well, the answer is no. Um, I think we're going to remain a major center of international litigation regardless. We, um, let me give you some illustrations. At the moment we have on our, in our, the cases in front of us, I've got a case where the Russian government is suing the Ukrainian government in London. Uh, I've got one where we're being asked to decide who is the, the, the legitimate president of Venezuela. Um, I've got one where the EU Commission uh, and uh, the government of um, Romania uh, are uh, suing each other. Yeah. Um, we have, um, because of our Privy Council jurisdiction, we have an enormous number of cases to do with um, Russian enterprises, Chinese enterprises. Um, frankly, I don't believe there is any court anywhere in the EU that has anywhere near the level of international litigation that we deal with. And it's not, I think, dependent on um, the Lugano Convention or membership of the EU. These are people, for example, the, the Russia-Ukraine case, that's because the contract that we entered into chose English law as a governing law and London, well, the England as the um, jurisdiction of choice. Okay. So, you know, partly it's because commercial parties and governments are choosing to come to us that, that we have this work. And provided we carry on providing, provided we carry on giving them a top quality service um with judges they trust and who they feel will give them a, a, a good decision on the law and provided the law remains sufficiently certain and predictable for people to want to use english law then i i don't see any reason why that should should stop um it's, that's all that we have time for in the questions but thank you so much for speaking to us today we really really appreciate it um i'm conscious that it provides <laughs> a few minutes over time there but it was fascinating to hear from you and like a, a massive honor for the society well that's kind of you um but i'm honored by the award and i'm very grateful to the society and its members and yourself jonathan for uh, conducting this ceremony no problem at all thank you so much and hopefully we'll get to get you over in person as soon as, as soon as the coronavirus i hope so sure thank you very much right then bye